Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So um, I, this is gonna be coronary challenging case competitions, uh, semifinals two. I'm Rianne Davies, I'm based out of York, Pennsylvania. We're just gonna go down and introduce ourselves. Uh, thank you, Mazen Abu Fadel. I'm with uh, Oklahoma Heart Hospital and University of Oklahoma. Um, I'm Yash Jag, and I work at Baylor Heart and Vascular in Dallas. Is Dr. Mina Gattas in the room? Okay. Um, what about Dr. Peter Solanos? Perfect. All right. Let's learn about DK Crush, please. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, five minutes for the talk, and then we'll have discussions. Our last speaker is not here, and so far our first one, so we may extend the discussions a little bit to uh, make up for the time. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Peter Servanus, working at uh, Magdi Aoub Foundation, Aswan, Egypt. Uh, my case is today is uh, about uh, DK crash in uh, a patient with achondroplasia. So uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, my case was 64 year old gentleman has a chondroplasia. His height was 1.4 meters. Uh, he has chronic renal impairment presented with non ST acute coronary syndrome. And uh, after many trial challenging to get access, failed radial, right radial approach, finally uh, we did coronary angiogram uh, uh, via right femoral approach using uh, diagnostic left. Uh, JATCOM4 uh, and diagnostic right 4 and as uh, you uh, may show, uh, his right coronary has a severe lung lesion in mid RCE and he has uh, proximal LED with obviously non landing zone in austere LED and uh, uh, the left meniscus trifurcates into LED ramus and circumflex and the proximal ramus have a border line towards severe lesion in the proximal ramus. So uh, a chondroplasic patient has many challenges, uh, starting from anatomy and getting the access and uh, 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 getting through the physiology. Uh, most of those patients have, have chronic, uh, complex coronary artery disease. Uh, many mechanisms be, uh, uh, comes behind this presentation, uh, starting from mutational status affecting the cross hormones and the progress of cell division which affect the uh, presentation of premature atherosclerosis and the propensity for arterial occlusion of narrow vessels and ending with uh, uh, disturbance in the hormonal and the metabolic activity in those patients. So the challenge of management, uh, we have three vessel disease, left main, trifurcation, and RCA. So our team discussion was uh, done and I get, uh, uh, taking into consideration the difficulty in surgery, starting from anesthesia and uh, uh, ending with getting the surgical grafts the patient was opted for scheduled DBCI. We started with uh, uh, access also was challenging. So left ax femoral access was adopted with Mullins cheese, 80 centimeter lens, uh, eight French for passive guide catheter support was inserted due to severe iliac tortuosity and uh, guiding seven from French, uh, run through wire was put in LED, another run through in the first diagonal, which appears diseased osteally, and a third ramus in the, a third run through was put in the ramus intermediates. Ivas catheter was introduced for sizing the LED and ramus and uh, showing the black burning of both vessels. Uh, and uh, uh, the ramus proved to be have significant lesion. The LED was 4.5 to 5 vessel diameter was uh, uh, significant black burden and the ramus also uh, around three millimeter vessel diameter was significant black uh, burden. So uh, DK crush was adopted. Firstly, 2.75 stent, uh, drug routing stent was deployed at mid LED. Uh, then uh, 7.2.75 millimeter drug stent was put on the proximal ramus, protruding in the left main shaft. Uh, crushing the ramus stent was done by uh, uh, two by 20 millimeter balloon, then 4.5 balloon. And first casing was done 
uh, by uh, 3.315 millimeter balloon uh, in the Remus and 3 by 15, 3.25 by 15 in the LED. Uh, left minus tinting uh, was done uh, by 4 by 22 uh, drug eluting stent, overlapped with the previous stent in the LED. And the boat was done using 4.5 uh, by 12 millimeter in a C balloon. Second kissing was done. And uh, here is the final results with TME2 flow in the circumflex, which was accepted regarding that uh, Remus was the most prominent vessel uh, and improved a little bit with some pharmacological management. And here is the final results with TME3 flow in the LED and pinched out Remus. The molen cheese was removed and replaced by eight French femoral cheese. And here is the post-stenting IFS image of both LED and Remus stents. So uh, my uh, key learning points for the operator and the team, dwarfs have an increased risk for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. A chondroplasia is the most prevalent cause accounting for more than 90% of short stature individuals. The risk of heart disease is twice as high in a chondroplastic dwarfs compared to the general population and the three times as high when comparing a milk a chondroplastic dwarfs with the general population. Uh, and um, endovascular access have uh, difficult challenges using the transit approach due to short limbs, elbow angles, and kyphoscoliosis. About one third of patients with achondroplasia have multi-vessel coronary artery disease and the critical coronary, uh, coronary artery disease, the form of left main disease by forcation inclusion has been described in those patients. Two thirds of patients uh, undergo coronary intervention and one third un undergo cabbage as a management strategy for uh, this coronary complex uh, disease. Extra backup guide catheter for passive support by long sheaths usually is needed as a key step for success in engaging and dealing with complex coronary lesions, especially in those patients. And finally, thinking outside the box and managing side issues are mandatory skills for good interventionists. And thank you. And always remember, complexity comes behind the short. Thank you for attention. Well done. I think uh, uh, the trifurcation alone is a hard thing to sometimes deal with. And when you're dealing with access issues and everything else, you manage that quite well. Um, any comments? Yeah, so uh, achondroplasia is the most common cause of dwarfism. So obviously the height becomes an issue. So, um, you know, what are some of the takeaways that you had? So you spoke about some of the access issues. Well, when thinking about guide length and things like that, did you have to do any sort of modifications? Sorry? Uh, the, gu the guide length and access issues, did you have to make any modifications? Yes, I, I used the guideline. Uh, we, don't, we didn't have long sheets, so we used the Molen sheets to give guide catheter support to, uh, for engaging uh, and dealing with uh, the coronary lesions uh, and doing the bifurcation, the tri bifurcation lesion in left system. Uh, so uh, actually we got uh, stuck with the diagnostic coronary angiogram, so planned for using the modern cheese after the diagnostic coronary angiogram. Um, I, uh, that's a great case, by the way. Um, I guess my question would be, despite the fact that, uh, you know, achondroplasia, um, the, the coronaries by imaging actually looked fairly normal sized. Is that something you expected when you uh, did this uh, intervention? Yes, uh, so intravascular imaging was helpful in uh, uh, showing the extensive atherosclerotic lesions, especially in the proximal ramus, and helped a lot in, in deciding the proper management strategy for this patient. What was also interesting is that the coronary diameters were actually quite normal in size, which is interesting. Yeah, like you're putting normal size coronary stents in, yeah. in somebody where I wouldn't necessarily expect that to be the case, and I was wondering if that surprised you or not. And, and the aorta, actually, because, I mean, normal, normal size guides were used, so I was thinking you would need, a nor like, a smaller size guides or, you know, because the aorta would be smaller or the coronaries would be smaller diameter-wise, but it's not the case, and I'm not sure if that's the usual in achondroplasia or not. Uh, achondroplasia, I think, is a, a stretching of the vessels and the electro mainly, uh, what's the problem in engaging? So uh, 
it's the, I think the problem is not that uh, small or a tall vessels, are, uh, rather than stretching or compressing the vessels, especially the iliac vessels in a chondroplegic patients. And did you, I mean, you used eight French. Did you think that was a little bit too big for that? Patient, to be honest with you, I mean, we expected I know that. it's a lot of tortuosity, yes, but you got over it very nicely with the sheath and the long sheath. Uh, definitely would highly be recommended, as you saw, it helped your intervention so much. But was an eight French needed in, in that specific person with, with all the vascular problems that they have, bleeding issues? Yes, uh, we secured the uh, vascular access and uh, replaced the uh, molen sheath after intervention with an eight French catheter and good compression. and. Uh, uh, fortunately, we didn't uh, need to use vascular occlusion devices after the procedure, uh, but I think uh, it French was helpful in uh, managing uh, free vessel disease and was anticipating problems during the uh, procedure. Curious in the audience, how many people out there have taken care of a patient with this disease? Yeah. I haven't personally. Have anybody on the panel otherwise? Yes. No. The only thing is the length part, so the radio becomes quite problematic just because you have a lot of the catheter hanging out of the body. So femoral works fine. Again, it's still going to hang out a decent amount. Um, I, it, again, in, I haven't done a lot of cases in patients with achondroplasia, but in those that I have, um, tortuosity wasn't really an issue, or at least I don't recall it being. Um, but you know, we are very quick to just put on bright tips which, you know, for CTOs, we use them regularly um, just to give better support. Um, but again, very well done. The final result looked fantastic. Um, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, didn't, um, yeah, Dr. Gottes, Mina Gottes, did she come in? Or did he, sorry. Hi. <laughs> All right, so um, presenting on uh, Minoka and ACS. Uh, my case about Ali Shaheen, he is a male patient, 52 years old, hypertensive, not diabetic, he's a smoker, presented firstly to our outpatient clinic, complaining of exertional dyspnea. That lasted for three mo six months, improved with medical treatment. Six days later, the patient presented to the ER department by typical chest pain, that radiating to the left shoulder, sweaty and dizziness. On examination, vital signs with uh, we are in normal values. Initial workup uh, was done, including uh, chest X-ray was normal, lab was normal, but the cardiac markers were mildly elevated. And the ECG at presentation was left bundle with sinus tachycardia, an echo showing dilated LV dimension, Mightly impaired LV systolic function, ejection fraction was 45, and the grade 2 diastolic dysfunction associated with segmental motion abnormality at the LED trajectory as shown in the video. I think there is error. How can I close this? Go, go ahead. Uh, but it masking the. Anyone can hit me? It's not, it's not advancing. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, you can continue. It's, it's there. Okay. We can back, back slide. Is there a back? Yes. Yeah. Yes. See the slide. Play the video from here. So your presentation will go away when five minutes are over. So you need okay, to- Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> As the patient presented by STEMI equivalent, uh, left bound the branch block with typical chest pain, we planned for regular coronary angiography to assess the coronary flow 
and anatomy. <coughs> Radial axis was selected and the cast lab are activated. The coronary angiography showing the following. Left mean with normal, bifurcating. Uh, LED show mid-segment total occlusion with faint anti-grade flow. Non-significant lesion in the LCX and distal significant lesion at the RCA. So, <coughs> we noticed that the flow improving every injection from TIMI 3, sorry, from TIMI 0, improving to TIMI 1, as shown in the following video. Another, oh. We decided to give intracronary vas dilators, and the flow improved dramatically within the LED from TIMI 1 to TIMI 3 flow. And the LED show non significant lesion as follow. The flow improving only with intracronary vas dilators. Can anyone see the underlying pathology? It will be clear in the following videos. Yes. LED shows significant myocardial breach at its mid segment that probably considered the reason for severe spasm occurred leading to severe myocardial ischemia and angina. The patient has a long mid-LED segment tunneled with a myocardium that can precipitate frequent attack of spasm and myocardial ischemia, especially with tachycardia and stress. Later on, coronary CT was done, showing a mid-LED longest segment, about 30 millimeter, lying within the myocardium, as shown in the CT image. Let us to remember. The patient presented by new onset of left mandel on ECG, and segmental will motion at the LED triotary in echo, and uh, LED myocardial bridge in coronary angiography. So the provisional diagnosis was MRI with non-obstructive coronary artery disease, on top of myocardial breach. But the remaining question, is this form of myocardial breach explain the reduced LV function, was 35, the dilated LV dimension, 6.1, or there is an underlying fake cardiac condition? So detailed history was taken from the patient and the data of clinical significance was attack of respiratory viral infection two weeks ago that continued for a few days associated with Sorry? Yeah, time is up. Oh. Okay. You, you, can, you can conclude. Yeah. Tell us what you found. Um, I found the patient showing a post viral myocarditis complicated by dilated cardiomyopathy. And it was a remaining cause for dyspnea, the first presentation for the patient. And the second cause for dyspnea is myocardial breach. So the patient has combined etiology for menoka dilated cardiomyopathy on top of post viral myocarditis and probably COVID. Uh, and the second cause is myocardial breach. The plan was uh, surgical unroofing for the breach after failure of uh, medical therapy. Uh, the medication, the discharge medication was antiplatelet and low dose of anticoagulation to improve the slow flow and also intracronal, sorry, and also vasodilators. Uh, the patient improved dramatically on the medical treatment till now uh, with NIHA class one. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> to um, further diagnose the myocarditis, did you get an MRI or anything yes, like that? Oh, yes, MRI, nice. um, image is my good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, sorry, quick question. So uh, how many uh, patients have you guys ever experienced that needed unroofing of their myocardial bridge? One. One, yeah. So I was going to... 
Yeah, so if, if you look at at least, you know, any sort of intravascular imaging data, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of the population has some form of a myocardial bridge, particularly in the LAD. And so it's exceptionally rare that anyone would ever actually need true unroofing. Um, in a situation like this, uh, would you guys send the patients uh, out on antiplatelet therapy? Is there any role? There's some slow flow, maybe there's microvascular dysfunction along with a bridge, uh, perhaps a, beta, uh, a calcium channel blocker alone. Uh, is there any role for DAPT here? So calcium channel blocker would be good for muscle bridging probably, um, you know, one of the ones that also decrease contractility and, and heart rate for apomelocardism. Um, that will help with both if there's spasm or also with the myocardial bridging. Uh, you know, he did have a non-STEMI, theoretically. I don't know how high his troponins went up. So even if you're doing medical therapy for, you know, just the ACS presentation, because there was, you know, regional wall motion abnormalities, you documented there was no flow in the LED at some point. You know, I, I mean, we, we do it. I do it. But I don't know if there's a lot of data to support this specific kind of patients. But they did present with a non-STEMI, so medical therapy guidelines, guideline directed would say to use dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, but for for the you know remember most of the coronary flow happens in diastole, and these muscle bridges are are squeezed in systole. The problem that we see quite a bit is at the edges of these muscle bridges where there's a lot of turbulent flow. That's where atherosclerosis can happen. And there was a little bit of a lesion you could see at the distal edge of that muscle bridge in multiple views. I didn't see it on the CT image that you showed, but on angiography you can see like where the kink is, where the like. There's a little bit of narrowing there. That's where the problem was to start with. Yeah. So maybe when the spasm happened, there was a, lot, a little bit of thrombus there or something that just improved. But uh, yeah, I would say medical therapy and rarely unroofing. I mean, I've, I've literally had just one patient went for unroofing because they were extremely symptomatic at a very young age. Remember, most of these muscle bridges are found incidentally in 60 and 70 year old patients when they come to the cath lab, but they've had them all their lives when they were young and running and jogging and doing everything. So. So let me ask a follow-up question to that because, you know, it's not uncommon that in patients who have myocardial bridges, we actually do see um, significant stenoses. What do we do with it? It's usually on the edges. It's not usually in the middle, as you suggested. So do you stent it? Do you send it to the surgeon? No. What, what do you do? And then how do you do it is the, the follow-up question. You know, what stent do you put in? If you're going to stent it, are you going to leave it alone? Are you going to send it to the surgeon? So let's just ask the panel. Yeah, I think avoiding stenting in a myocardial bridge is, is key, but sometimes you're, you are left with no option. Sometimes patients present with STEMI, and they, it, you don't know it until you either image or um, get flow restored there. Um, I think this is where intravascular ultrasound or OCT can certainly help, too, because if there is a lesion going into the bridge where you can avoid a, and have a good stent edge prior to it, that might be the most ideal situation. Yeah, I think if there's any indication for patients to go to surgery, that would be... Uh, what, the, what needs to be done, and most of the time they don't unroof it, they just put a lima to the distal LED, which is appropriate. Um, you know, I've, I've had exactly that experience where a patient comes in with a STEMI and you put a stent, and then you notice this is a, an area of a muscle bridge. The only thing I would, I've done and I would suggest is don't, if you have to do it, don't end the stent in the middle of the muscle bridge, just cover the whole muscle bridge. And most of the time, you know, patients do okay. The radial strength is a problem, especially with the newer stents. The older stents, the radial strength were like thicker struts. They used to like probably not kink as much. So stent fracture is a real issue. And if that happens, then definitely you're left with one option, which is to go to bypass, even if it's just Lima to the LED after a stent fracture, in my opinion at least. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, probably won't use a thin strut um, stent in this case, uh, like by, like, or at least Biotronic, which is 70 microns versus um, maybe something else that's 100. Um, I think DCBs would probably have a good role, uh, you know, if if and when they are approved. Yeah, um, uh, I would agree with that. I mean, um, you know, in part of our brachytherapy program, uh, there's a you know subpopulation that you see, and it's patients that have had myocardial bridges that have been stented and then re-stented for stent fracture, and they still don't do well. So if you can avoid stenting, do it. Maybe surgery and or DBs in the future may be the um, optimal approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then can we get our next speaker for dissection or lesion, Mina Seha? Hey, good morning.
morning, everybody. Uh, I am Mina Siha, intervention cardiologist from Sohag, Egypt. Our case today is it a dissection or lesion. The clinical presentation, uh, eight, uh, 58 years old female patient complaining from exertional epigastric pain last two weeks. She is hypertensive, dyslipidemic, and ex-smoker. Her clinical examination was unremarkable. ECG was normal. The echo showed grade one diastolic dysfunction and stress ECG was done and it was positive for exercise induced ischemic heart disease. We starting with here full anti ischemic, uh, but she is still complaining, so we did coronary angiography for her. Here is the left system showing long segmental mid LED lesion. Here is another view. Lateral view. And the right coronary showing distal lesion borderline followed by a dissection, long segment dissection. The decision was done to did a PCI to LED, uh, a SAHI software using and use direct stenting, uh, drug looting stent three by 33 millimeter. doesn't go back. Ah. Okay. With the final result of LED, good final result after boot. So what is the next step? What do you think about RCA lesion? Will you leave it or wire it and stent? May the dissection affect the flow in the RCA? May it be the cause of such symptoms? We decided to, get, to have another look on the RCA, the same, so we decided to uh, uh, hospitalize the patient for two to four days and follow up of the chest pain and ECG as the patient has no other, uh, high risk features of left main dissection or sustained arrhythmias or cardiogenic shock and follow up if there is has recurrent chest pain or ECG changes. So we hospitalized the patient and follow up, but the patient is still complaining from the same criteria of chest pain with no ECG changes. So we decided according to this algorithm, which is reprinted from the Jack in 2022, if we give conservative therapy and the patient still has recurrent chest pain, so we consider repeat angiogram, which shows the same lesion borderline in the distal part followed by the dissection and wiring showing a he soft which shows that the lesion is unremarkable and the dissection probably sealed by the wire. And we didn't put a stent. The dissection was sealed by the wire without the need to put a stent due to non-significant stenosis after sealing the dissection. The patient has been transferred to the CCU with no symptoms at all for four days. Multiple follow-up visits were done for one year with no chest pain. Our take-home message, SCAD is an important cause of acute coronary syndrome, particularly in women, even without traditional cardiovascular risk factors. It's difficult to differentiate between symptomatic and asymptomatic SCAD, especially in presence of significant lesion in another coronary artery rather than the dissecting one. Most coronary dissections will heal spontaneously and conservative treatment is recommended for uncomplicated cases. Patients with left main stem involvement, complete vascular occlusion, ongoing chest pain, or hemodynamic instability will require coronary revascularization. PCI results are suboptimal in this challenging group of patients. PCI should be performed by experienced operator with the use of intravascular imaging, either IVAS or OCT, which is not available at our center at that day and preferably with on-site surgical backup due to increase the risk of complication. And finally, although the long-term prognosis is excellent, the risk of recurrent SCAD event is significant with an average rate of 5% per year. And thank you. You know, um, thank you for presenting this case. I, th I think this is an interesting case. The question is, is this really a dissection, you know? Um, th this is the flow, the flow dynamics are very abnormal, and you see that line, which you see it in big RCAs. Um, imaging would have been ideal. It's sad that you, we don't have these images, and I understand the limitations. And, and, um, but many times, 
and I've done it myself, that's where I'm coming from, you image, and this is perfectly normal. It's very hard for a wire to tuck a dissection that big completely, and when you remove the wire, it stays tucked in. The wires can tuck dissections, there's no question, but usually when you remove the wire, the this, this spontaneous coronary artery dissections take time to heal. They don't heal that quickly. I think, and I'll like to see what the panel thinks, I think this is flow dynamics are abnormal here. Maybe there's a little bit of something there that made it abnormal. Um, I usually try to give nitro adenosine, see if they get better, inject more contrast, and it will, will kind of get the artery more opacified and better. I'm not 100% convinced this dissection, but that's my personal opinion. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, uh, again, the fact that it's a large vessel like that and just got tacked up with a wire um, conceptually, I mean, is it possible? The answer is yes, but I don't think that uh, makes the most sense. And so I think it just may have been abnormal flow dynamics, just like you stated. And again, intravascular imaging would have resolved that easily, either with OCT or IFIS. Um, a question for the panel, you know, let's say this was SCAD, and I'm sure, you know, you guys have a lot of SCAD patients in your practice. Um, are you guys doing repeat CTs uh, three months, six months after the event, or they're symptom-free, and then um, what, what kind of imaging are you doing for um, FMD uh, rule-out uh, in these cases? FMD rule out is very important and we do the whole panel to make sure they don't have that. Repeat imaging, we don't, because even if you see it, what are you gonna do about it? I mean, if the patient is asymptomatic, they're doing good, and we have a number of them, and we are part of the registry, so we do have a big number of patients, and you know, we do the diagnostic, we try not to intervene, not to do anything, unless they present with a STEMI or others, and we've had some of these too. But just to answer your question, I don't, and we don't in our center. So I'm uh, fortunate enough to uh, work with one of the um, SCAD and FMD specialists, uh, Dr. Heather Gornick at my institution. So um, I refer all these patients to her. Um, I haven't seen her um, do a repeat coronary angiogram or anything like that. Um, actually, what she does is she looks at the other vascular beds. So she does a CT of the head. She does a CT of the carotids. She does a CT of the, the renals and the peripheral vascular disease. But I haven't seen her do anything else related to a cardiac issue. Um, I haven't seen her ask for a repeat angiogram or anything like that. She just treats them medically. How, how did your patient go? Very well. <laughs> just for one year, up till now. <laughs> Well, just to ask about that LED uh, stenting, just to talk about, you know, there was this post-stenotic dilatation. Um, would you guys have done anything differently with stenting that LED? Just a question, just because probably in that segment, the LED was not completely, you know, expanded, or it was expanded, but not opposed to the wall. Would you have stopped the stent just, uh, just you know, in the mouth of the post-stenotic dilatation, or would you have stented all the way down across it? That's a very good question. Um, actually, my thought was, you know, if I had a question about whether SCAD was in the right coronary and I'm going after the left, I probably wouldn't image the LAD um, to see if, if it's actually atherosclerotic disease or, um, or if it's uh, something else. Um, I, I think opinions vary. Um, there are cases where I would probably stent into that, that post-stenotic uh, area and just try to bang it out as big as I can. There are other instances where I'm gonna actually stent right across that thing, um, hoping that it'll negatively model over time and come back to normal, so. All right, well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, and how about our next speaker? Um, for easy at first, then tough all through, a CTO story, Ahmed Kamal. Good morning. Uh, I am Ahmed Kamal, cardiology lecturer in Kasratayani Hospital, Cairo University. I am glad to present my case today, easy at first and tough all through CTO story. I have no disclosures. Our patient is a 60-year-old gentleman. He is ex-smoker. He is known as chemical disease with PCI to the LED by one drug looting stand seven years ago. Two months ago, he experienced recurrent attacks of typical angina pectus, canadian clot 3. His ECG showed no ST segment or T wave changes. His echocardiography showed normal LV dimensions and contractility, no regional motion abnormalities, and no significant valvular lesions. 
we do diagnostic coronary angio, and as we can see, there is significant lesion in OIM1 branch and L6 artery. There is patent LED stent with retrograde collaterals to the RCA. There is CTO mid RCA with faint anti grade flow. We decided to do PCI for the CTO RCA first and then tackle the OM lesions second. We used a Fielder XTR wire over Crosshair uh, Pro microcaster, which failed to cross the CTO segment. We do wire escalation using Gaia second wire, which successfully crossed the CTO segment, but the microcaster failed to cross. We used the PTCE balloon 1.2 times 15 millimeter, which failed to cross the CTO segment. However, with multiple uh, trials, uh, the PTA balloon finally crossed the CTO segments after many trials and aided by the guide extension. We do pre-dilatation using PTA balloon 2 times 15 millimeters and NC balloon 3 times 15 millimeter. The lesion is now ready to deliver our first drug looting stent, which was 3.5 times 33 millimeters. However, something went wrong you can expect from the image, especially on the right side, that the stand gets shortened over the balloon, which is during the manipulation. We tried to manipulate the stand, withdrawing it and pushing it. It became deformed over the balloon. In this situation, we cannot do any maneuvers because if we uh, withdraw the, the stand, we can uh, have the balloon out of the stand. And so we had to deploy the stand in its place. We don't exactly wear the stand in the RCA, but we had to deploy it. We do post dilatation of the stent using NC balloon 3.5 times 20 millimeter. After that, all balloons failed to cross the distal edge of the stent at the CTO segment, even when using body wire for more support. Also, guide extension was of no help here due to the deformed proximal edge of the stent. Finally, 1.2 millimeter PCE balloon crossed the CTO segment, followed by PCE balloon 2 times 15 millimeter, then NC balloon 3 times 15 millimeter. Short 3.5 times 18 millimeter drug loading stand failed to cross the CTO segment, so pre dilatation was done again using NC balloon 4 times 12 millimeters. Finally, a 3.5 times 18 millimeter drug loading stand managed to pass through the CTO segment and deployed distally. And then the third drug loading stand 3.5 times 22 millimeters was deployed to cover the gap between the previously deployed two stands. Post dilatation using PTCO balloon 4 times 12 millimeter was done. And then we do IVIS to see what happened in the proximal edge of the stand of the first stand. As we can see here, the stand is well opposed to the wall. And as we go proximal, we see now the proximal edge of the stand. And as we see that the stand is, uh, thanks God, it is uh, protruding outside of the RCE origin a little bit. And so we covered the ostium of the RCE and we became sure by using the IBIS. Our key learning uh, points here, we should prepare the region adequately to avoid any troubles during delivery of our stent. Shorter stents are better in tortuous calcified lesions because our first stent was a long stent, was 33 millimeter stent. Intravascular imaging is very important to ensure adequate results, especially after managing complications. Thank you. Yeah, great, great case, very good results. Um, why not use a guide extension before you try to even get the first end down, try to take it, you know, because you were able to balloon with non-compliant yes. balloons very nicely. Yes. Why not like balloon tracking or something, get the guide liner down or whatever you use, guide extension, and then unsheath the stent rather than try. We didn't expect that trouble. We, we ballooned with a 3 o balloon and it goes uh, smoothly. So we didn't expect that the stand will not go smoothly. It just happened during the very early manipulation of the stand. We just was positioning the stand in place, and all of a sudden, we seen this image. So probably got stuck on a calcium yes, plaque yes, or something. Yes, we wasn't expecting this. Yeah, so imaging up front may have been helpful here, but how much, um, it didn't appear to be a tremendous amount by your IVIS image that was hanging into the aorta, but did you measure how much was actually hanging out? One to two millimeters. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, it's not bad. And you actually then nailed uh, the, the we, ostium. We wasn't planning this. We had to deploy in this place. Yeah. But 
thanks to God, it, it came out with one to two millimeters, yeah. not too much or not too short. Alternatively, this is sometimes, you know, being comfortable with snaring or trying to remove it if before you deploy it, you know, you could have just removed the entirety of that stent. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we are afraid if we pull the, the balloon and the stent that the balloon gets out of the stent and we have now a, a stent without the balloon, we have to crush it again at the wall mm -hmm. with another stent, so we put three layers of stent we uh, prefer to deploy it in its place, and if we have a very, uh, a very short segment of uncovered osteal RCE, we'll put a very short stent in it. But the IVUS proved that it's covered only the, or the RCE osteal. Okay. I think, I think um, you know, unlike other presenters, you have the luxury of having all the imaging and stuff, which is great. Um, maybe the IVUS should have come up before you try to bring the stent down, you know? Maybe after ballooning IVUS the vessel, maybe that would have helped you see a lot of calcification or something. Do you think this would have changed your management if you had IVS not just after the stent, but actually before you even attempted to stent at all? Uh, uh, when we used the balloon 3.0 and it opened freely, uh, there was no waste in the balloon, we feel free that the stent will go smoothly and we will have no problem. But this doesn't happen because uh, uh, most probably there was a calcium spur in the vessels that we can see on imaging, uh, on, on regular angiography. It will appear on the imaging using IVUS, but we didn't expect that. Um, so our retrospective scope is 2020, you know, seeing what you did. Um, so I think if I had that much work to do um, to open up a balloon on crossable lesion with all these other balloons. Um, I, I may have tried to put a guide extension down. The other thing, you know, if your 3.0 balloon goes, I'll actually pull the used balloon back into the guide and push back and forth and see how much resistance there is and see if I can actually get a stent down there or if I need to put a guide extension down before I start putting metal in. So those are kind of easy tricks you can use. Yeah, that's a very good point. An unwrapped balloon, if it goes freely across the lesion, then you won't have a problem with the stent usually because there's, the stent is a metal. I understand it can hook, but if if a wrapped if an unwrapped balloon has a lot of difficulty going back and forth, you probably need need to do some more the, work. The on balloon that. was going freely and was three O balloon, so we didn't expect that. And so your case just brings up the issue of what if you have uh, a stent but the balloon isn't with it? What do you do? So it really falls down to two different pathways. The first pathway is that you have a wire across the stent or if you don't. If you have a wire across it, your options are markedly more than if you don't. If you don't have a wire across it, there's basically three things you can do. One, you just have to basically um, try to rewire through the middle of it. Good luck, that's not gonna really happen. But you have to either stent, exclude it, and crush it, or you have to snare it out, usually. If it's in the periphery, let's just say it's somewhere in the abdominal pelvic vasculature, the vast majority of times you can leave it alone. And we know this from the early stent era where stents would unfortunately embolize. If you have a wire across it, then you can do the same things where one, you can crush it and then um, with another wire and then stent uh, exclude it. Two, you can uh, snare it. Three, you can get serial balloons through like you did and then balloon dilatate and then actually deploy the stent. Another thing you can do is if you can get a balloon that's slightly undersized um, to the vessel distally, but you can get it through the actual stent, you can inflate it distally and pull it all back out. But obviously that requires losing wire position. Another technique you could potentially use is you can use a series of wires uh, alongside of your old stent and then twirl them together and then sort of wrap them together and you can extract everything out as a unit. And then another thing you could do if you have your guide liner is you can put your guide liner as far as you can to try to cover as much of the stent, pin a balloon next to it, and then pull it all out as a unit. So these are all additional techniques. Fortunately, you didn't need to do any of that. I think you did a fantastic job. It looked great. But these are the things to keep in mind should it happen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will present the next case also. Oh, perfect. All right. Then carry on. All right, another case. Can we restart the timer for the next case, please? It's the same presenter. Thank you. Uh, our case today is the city in city OPCI. You should trust your instincts. I have no disclosures. Uh, we have a 57 years old male. He's diabetic, ex smoker. He had PCI to the LED and RCA by two per metal stands 12 years ago then PCI to LED in stent restenosis by one drug looting stance two years later. He had cabbage seven years ago by two grafts lima to the LED and saphenous vein graft to IM1 branch. Now he had chest pain on minimal effort. 
had to do coronary angiography. We had an LAD total instant stenosis, diffusely diseased uh, LCX with retrograde collaterals to the RCA. We had an RCA total uh, instant stenosis, as shown here. Patent limit to the LAD with patent substance ring graft to OM branch. We decided to PCI for the CTO RCA instant stenosis. We used Jotkin right 3.56 French guiding caster for the RCA and Jotkin left 3.56 French guiding caster for left main. Fielder XTA wire over Crossepro microcaster was used. Wire escalation using Gaia second wire guided by retrograde injection, as you can see here. Seems true lumen in one view, but appears to be false lumen in another view. We use another view, as we can see here on the right panel. We withdraw uh, our microcaster to move proximal segment to avoid entry to false lumen and escalation to Gaia third wire. However, the wire persistently enters into false lumen confirmed by the retrograde injection. At this time, we were exhausted, used three wires, and created a large dissection plan, but we decided to give our last wire his chance before terminating the procedure. Unexpectedly, the Conquest Pro wire finds its way through what seems true lumen into distal RCA. Pre-dilatation using PTC balloon 1.5 times 20 millimeter, followed by 2 times 20 millimeter balloon, then 3 times 15 millimeter balloon at the CTO segment. Unfortunately, we had no anti-grade or retrograde flow after all this dilatation with 3O balloon. We used a larger NC balloon, 3.5 times 20 millimeter, hoping that we can establish flow across the CTO segment, but also failed. Our clinical child that we had strong belief that we are in true lumen despite absence of flow across the CTO segment. We assumed there was a hematoma that compressed the true lumen, and we took the risk with the next step. We deployed three times 30 millimeter drug looting stand at the site of the CTO segment. And surprisingly, the artery opened. We then do a 3.5 times 40 millimeter drug looting stand was deployed at the mid RCA, then four times 22 millimeter drug looting stand was deployed at the proximal RCA covering the whole RCA. We had a good final result and the hematoma disappeared The key learning from this case is that we always take two orthogonal views to be sure that we are in the true lumen. Intravascular imaging is very, very helpful during complex PCI and would have confirmed the presence of hematoma and guide our decision. We didn't use the IVAS in this case, actually. CTO PCI needs an experienced operator and team to achieve good results. Thank you. The uh, orthogonal views are certainly very helpful whenever you're doing CTOPCI. I think what would have kind of solved it and the risk of potentially stenting into a bad spot could have been just imaging up front. And sometimes what you find is that intramural hematoma that you may have created, you can just kind of slice with Option. a cutting balloon. Option, yeah, yes. less stent than long term for the patient, but good result. Uh, just uh, two technical aspects. One, um, when you became subintimal with one of your initial wires, uh, there were anti-grade guided injections. So the problem with that is if you're subintimal and you inject anti-grade, you're going to hydraulically propagate the dissection and make it much harder to re-enter. So uh, it, you did use a good amount of retrograde injections, but there was definitely times when you were subintimal where there was anti-grade injections. So yes. don't do that. And speaking to what Rianne said, I mean, intravascular imaging really helps solve if you're in the true lumen or the false lumen. It's pretty obvious. You just look for an area where you can see all three layers of the vessel um, to know that you're in the true lumen. And if you can't, then you know you're probably subintimal. Yes. Yeah, um, in, in this case, I, I agree. You know, actually, when I'm working on a right like this, what I like to do is take my initial setup shot and then I put a guide extension down there. I plug the cornering. Um, I, I want it to dampen on my my uh, my monitor because once you start getting in there, it's hard to tell. You're going to assume you're true lumen, but you know by data that happens 65% of the time or so, and a lot of times you're in the subintimal space. And if you're in the subintimal space, then it becomes about hematomal formation control, which in a right coronary artery that's totally occluded and collateralized, you just just plug the thing, right? 
and then you do uh, retrograde injections to figure out where you are, and that gives you time if you're uncomfortable doing ADR, parallel wire, what have you, to pull your gear back a little bit, do use other wires to try to get in the true lumen without a huge hematoma formation. And, and the, other, the other thing is what Darshan said, which is, you know, don't do a lot of anti-grade pictures. Um, I typically use an imaging catheter when I think I cross to make sure I've crossed and to know where I am actually need to, to stent, so. Just, just a question. Do you think this was a hematoma, or do you think just where you re-entered, you know, when you ballooned, there was a flap there that was occluding flow? I mean, maybe, I'm just maybe a maybe dissection flap, maybe a hematoma. You, we I mean, I was, I was hoping you would have a retrograde picture when there was no flow to see. Maybe it would have. We held. had a retrograde injection, yes, and, and, it, the, and the retrograde stops at the CTO segment. Okay. okay. And the anti-grade at the same point, so you're not sure. Either you can use IVIS here. It can tell us. Yeah, I wonder if it's very, very focal, like you say. Yes, it's just one it's point. Very, very maybe focal. it's just the re-entry where the wire maybe, is. And maybe when you balloon it, it expands when you take the balloon maybe out. Flat, I mean, I'm yes. not sure, but we it's interesting sure. to... Yeah. Um, Great results, though. Just a question for um, you know, the CTO operators on the panel. Uh, if you're in a situation like this, do you guys ever leave the wire behind, go with a microcatheter and try and aspirate hematoma? Um, and then, you know, maybe take a second wire and try and get true lumen if you don't have access to a stingray? Yeah, sometimes when you're setting up for stingray, you do straw, um, and before advancing your um, wire that you're going to stick through um, the stingray device, you can aspirate through there. I've personally never taken a microcatheter down there. I know there's a lot of case reports and people that do occasionally do this over like a, a parallel system to try to um, pull some of that fluid out of that space. Yeah, I mean, the main failure mode is hematoma formation such that it compresses the true lumen and your ability to re-enter gets small and smaller using wire-based uh, strategies or balloon-based strategies. Um, originally, when straw was described, it was actually using a microcatheter that you put parallel to uh, another system that you were going to try to re-enter with, and you would uh, go negative. Um, there are newer systems like uh, Rian spoke about, so the recross catheter, one of the benefits of that is that you can actually um, aspirate, do straw with one of the ports while you try to re-enter with another port. You can't do that with the stingray balloon. Um, the other thing I found with the stingray balloon is when you straw, it, it kind of limits how much you can use it. Like if you if you try to bobsled after you try once, um, getting wires back and forth, it becomes extremely challenging with the uh, stingray LP. So. Um, I'll typically straw with a microcatheter if I need to straw, and then try to plug it with a guide extension, like I said before, and get a stingray down there and, and try to re-enter. And I, I typically try and stick and drive in those situations. Perfect. Thank you. Thank Great you. cases. Thank you for Thank both. You. And then can our next presenter come up for a rare case of ACS, Mina Shindoa? Uh, I am Mina, uh, Mina Schnuda from Egypt. How can I? Uh, no interest to be declared. Uh, 26 year young years old uh, female. Uh, has a history of uh, mitral mechanical procedure on top of severe rheumatic uh, mitral regurg. She has uh, no history of uh, diabetic or hypertension. Patient was not compliant on uh, vitamin K anticoagulant therapy. Uh, she was complicated by a previous attack of cerebral vascular accident with no residual deficit. Uh, she had uh, reduced mitral valve replacement on top of malfunction uh, mitral, mechanical mitral processes, uh, presented to us by attack of uh, typical chest pain. <coughs> Patient upon presentation was hemodynamic stable. ECG was done, showed ST elevation uh, in inferior lead, lead 2, 3, AF, plus a reciprocal ST uh, segment uh, depression at uh, higher lateral leads. Uh, it was diagnosed as STEMI. Uh, BCI team was activated. Uh, B uh, angio uh, angiography was done. CRO code uh, view show a ring of metal processes. Average length of uh, left mean uh, bifurcating to LED uh, that uh, was free from uh, any significant lesion and LCX uh, supplying several OM branches. 
The second OM branch uh, shows suspicious of distal uh, total occlusion. Uh, ROO cranial uh, view confirms distal occlusion of OM uh, branch, as you see. Uh, spider view uh, uh, show uh, two occluders and will function mechanical uh, processes. The occlusion of OM and the occlusion of AM confirm it. it. Right angiography was done. Uh, uh, show uh, dominant RCA without uh, significant lesion. Uh, we, we, we see there is no uh, any significant or no atherosclerotic disease in this case. Uh, it's it's uh, been uh, strange to be uh, MI. In this point, we 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 so we thought about the cause of young female without no previous uh, cardiovascular risk uh, and uh, diagnosed as MI. Uh, we we think about uh, coronary emboli uh, coronary embolism event as a history of uh, mechanical processes and not compliant on anticoagulant treatment. Uh, also, there is a history of a stroke. Uh, BCI was done. Uh, BMYR uh, was passed across uh, the second OM branch. Uh, then pre-dilatation was done uh, with a small non-compliant uh, balloon measuring one half by uh, 12 millimeter. Uh, as this image, uh, after uh, TIMI, two, three, TIMI 2 flow across OM branch with uh, relief of chest pain. Then after removal of the wire, TIMI 2 flow across OM branch with distal anti great filling. Uh, after BCI, uh, laboratory tests reveal uh, a high sensitive troponin level of uh, uh, 11 uh, nanogram. Uh, the upper limit is 0.06. It's a high level. Uh, INR uh, was sufficient was 0.9. Uh, it uh, on emergency admission, as she not not compliant on anti-agarant. Uh, trans uh, uh, echo. Uh, shows suspicious mass attached to mitral processes. So uh, transesophageal uh, echo uh, reveal uh, uh, was done and reveal well function mitral uh, mechanical processes with two masses attached to it uh, atrial aspect of mitral uh, mechanical processes. The large risk was uh, 1.6 by 0.6. Most of the thrombus. Uh, work up exclude the infective endocarditis. Heavy infusion was uh, administered for three days and warfarin was uh, started. Uh, follow, uh, follow up uh, transesophageal echo done after uh, two weeks revealed marked regression of the size of the masses. The largest one regressed from uh, 1.6 uh, by 0 0.6 to 0 0.6 uh, by 0 0.3, uh, about half. After achieving INR, the target of INR of three. The patient was discharged on uh, uh, warfarin, aspirin, pisoprolol, and proton bomb inhibitor. Uh, the key learning of this case, coronary embolization uh, in the mechanical process as a cause of acute coronary syndrome was a rare case, uh, not seen every, every day, uh, of unknown incidents. Uh, the, there is a lack of consensus of effective of treatment of uh, management of uh, coronary emboli. Uh, in this setting, in our case, uh, we do uh, management with uh, uh, just uh, angioplasty and given uh, a balloon and if it's right, intravenous without stenting. Thank you. I think these cases are always uh, um, challenging, particularly when you're dealing with young patients that have to be on anticoagulation. But with that being said, um, this I think is another instance where imaging maybe would have helped us too to really like look at that artery because it um, size and maybe uh, um, if there was something that was embolized down there versus a um, little bit of a dissection that may have occurred during the time too. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think <clears throat> you know. I mean, what's common is common. She has thrombus on the mitral valve. It's most likely embolized, but 
the angiogram looks a little bit also suspicious for spontaneous coronary dissection, which can yeah. happen in young female. Again, most likely it was an embolus, but you can never tell. But I think it's important to try and tell the difference um, because if it is uh, happened to be spontaneous coronary artery dissection, then you need to work that young lady up for, you know, other vascular disorders like we, what we discussed earlier. It's mm. it's really hard. The angiogram is is hard to decipher if it's uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. But when you said there were thrombus on the mitral valve, that makes it a little bit, mm. you know, you feel like uh, most likely yes, that's yes. what it is. But that's something to keep in, in mind for sure. I think that's an interesting case. Um, I, I guess the question from in my mind becomes, you know, if you believe that's coronary embolism and not SCAD and not plaque rupture, would you try to balloon it? Would you try to use an aspiration catheter, aspirate it out, and then image it? How would you how would you approach this? I guess is the question. Okay, uh, here's, here's my thinking. If, if you're going to put a wire and do something, I would have done something more than just 1.5 balloon, to be honest with you. First, you're committed, so either do it or don't do it. Um, and I would like to know what's happening. So for me, if I can reestablish good flow, I want to image. And again, I don't know if that's available where, where you're practicing because I want to make the right diagnosis because it does have long-term uh, you know, consequences if it's spontaneous coronary artery dissection and she had fibromuscular dysplasia and brain aneurysms. I mean, we need to know, especially if she's going to be on anticoagulation with an INR of three. So I think the, the pressure to make a right diagnosis is a little bit higher in this 26-year-old female on anticoagulation with an angiogram that looked like SCAGS, but most likely it may be, spo it may be embolization. It's, it's tough. It's a tough case. Very good case. Tough okay, case. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, wire image and then based on imaging, figure out what your strategy is going to be. If you think it's embolization, um, then go ahead with an aspiration thrombectomy catheter. And if, uh, and if that doesn't work, then potentially some sort of balloon modification like was done in this case. And if it's scad, just get out of Dodge if she's pain free. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think um, you probably should discharge her on aspirin and, uh, and Coumadin both, not just Coumadin alone, um, just given the, the event. Put her on aspirin too, uh, or do you just do Coumadin? Uh, I, I don't. What did you discharge her uh, medication? Discharge, uh, aspirin, and uh, warfarin. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have Perfect. Up? How is she doing? Do it's fine. She's doing good. Yes. yes. Wonderful. Well, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How about our left main quadrifurcation and left circumflex CTO, Mohammed Orabi? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I have no conflict of interest. So my case is 66 years old male, hypertensive diabetic disc epidemic. His complaint was exertional dyspnea since six months. He had a coronary angio at another hospital. <coughs> he was advised to have cabbage, but he refused. His syntax score with intermediate. So we decided to do intervention. This is his coronary angiography. We can appreciate an uh, CTO osteal uh, LCX. We cannot uh, see where it's the ostium uh, at this point, and uh, uh, osteal to proximal uh, LAD lesion. Uh, the left main is quadrifurcating into maybe uh, ramus uh, high diagonal and uh, LAD and LCX. This is a contralateral injection, and uh, we can see the LCX is getting epicardiac collateral from the RCA. So we decided with the ret starting with the retrograde as the, the ostium the, of the LCX is ambiguous, uh, <coughs> introducing a guide wire, a scion guide wire with a microcatheter fine cross uh, 150 through the epicardiac collateral. And we could introduce the guide wire into the LCX. At first it was uh, getting into the, uh, th through the ostium of LCX to the LAD and then we changed its direction to the LCX ostium to the left main, introduced the, the microcatheter into left main, into the, the, the get, uh, getting uh, the recipient guiding. And then uh, the, the case was straightforward after that, uh, a pre, pre dilatation, a kissing balloon inflation, and then starting with the left main LAD, uh, stenting, uh, 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 of course, after uh, 
uh, getting uh, uh, confirmation that we are in the true human using IVUS. After stenting, uh, uh, LCX OSTM stenting, uh, then pot, then kissing balloon, then pot. And this was the end result. Uh, we can see the OSTM of LCX and LLE are, are uh, um, good, are fixed good uh, with DM3 flow in both LAD and LCX. Uh, and uh, also confirmed by IVUS that uh, the stents uh, with the uh, well deployed and uh, well opposed. So uh, my key learning for this case is good planning is your way to success. Imaging modality should be obligatory in complex case for best results. Try to keep it simple as much as you can. And thank you. Excellent case. I think um, trifurcations are challenging. Quadrifications are even more challenging when it's dealing with the left main. Certainly when you're coming retrograde up through the left main, um, being cautious um, and using imaging there before uh, advancing any gear as to prevent hematoma or anything like that to come back into your left main space when you re-enter um, is always helpful. So it was good to see that imaging was used there. Um, but any comments? Yeah, you said keep it simple. I don't think that was that simple, but... <laughs> I, I, meant, I meant to say the quadrifurcation. I meant uh, no need for uh, kissing balloon for every uh, yeah. small branch. My, my question is, it's interesting. I mean, if this, if this came to an institution that cannot do all this, and obviously the symptoms were from the LED that had Timmy 2 flow, if that, maybe less on the one of the images, it was hardly filling. The patient was probably symptomatic from that. Would you have just fix the left main LED trifurcation and forgot the CERG that's been CTO for God knows how long? That's my question. I think it, uh, it, it really depends on, um, you know, who you present this to and what institution you're at. I, I think uh, a lot of operators probably would have just done the LED um, and not done the CERG. That's, that is not simple, by the way. That was a great case. Um, two points. One, um, it's interesting that you can do all that and not need any support at all. Um, epicardial retrograde through the right to get the circ open, bifurcation stenting and a quadrification in the left main and you got a, and you got a great result. Um, and two, I think when you're going retrograde, um, you gotta make sure you're in the left main and you don't um, pick up a dissection flap um, into the left main because if you're not 100% sure with IVUS and you did a great job doing that, you gotta make sure you're true lumen at the carina. Um, otherwise, you're gonna shut down one of the vessels or the other when you start stenting. Um, so that's a great job and that's, that's not simple. That was, that was a great job. Besides beside having IVUS in this case, uh, the wire uh, kept going into the distal LED before getting to, into the left main. That's uh, another way to, do, to know we are in the true lumen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think support is overused in this country, in my opinion, <laughs> B because we see a lot of great cases done without and they go really good. We, we, a lot of people tend to have very low threshold for support, in, in my opinion, without any evidence. But uh, yeah, any other thoughts, guys? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, first of all, uh, exceptionally well done. The final result was uh, terrific, uh, and you had to do an epicardial to get the CERC, which is, um, which is always tough and harrowing. Um, did you think about just trying to do an IVUS guided puncture? So just put a wire down into the LED IVUS and then see where the takeoff was and try to get something going anti-grade instead. Okay. Did you hear his question? Um, did you try to do IVUS guided puncture to get into the circumflex, like any anti-grade attempts before going retro? You just went right to the yeah. retrograde. Yeah. Because that may just have potentially been safer because obviously epicardial perfs, if you look at the um, open CTO registry, it was the epicardial perfs that um, led to the worst mortalities. So if you can try to avoid doing an epicardial, this might have just been a safer approach. Ultimately, you did it exceptionally well, um, but um, just as something to think about in the future. Okay, and then can we have our last presenter, CTO PCI and Woven Anomaly, uh, Michael Gurgis. Um, hi, thanks for having me in such an elegant meeting. Uh, my case is CTO PCI and um, Woven Anomaly. I have no disclosures. Um, my patient was 60 years old gentleman. He has um, hypertension. He is an ex-smoker. Un underwent PCI to the LCX um, back in 2010. 
and he was complaining of chest pain, um, Canadian Class 3. He underwent coronary angiography at another facility that showed CTO of the LED from its ostium with um, woven coronary anomaly, patent stent in the LCX, and CTO in the RCA, which showed um, um, woven anomaly as well. He was kept on um, optimum medical therapy. He um, still has chest pain, so he was referred to our center for intervention. <laughs> His echo showed a kinetic thinned out LED territory function was 35% with mild mitral regression. This is the angiogram at the referral hospital, paint and stent with uh, possibly occlusion at the distal OM. And this is the RCA shot selective in the coronal branch showing retrograde uh, filling of the LED, which in turn gives the septal uh, filling to the distal RCA. This is the RCA angiogram, total occlusion distally with distal uh, woven anomaly course. So in brief, um, woven coronary anomaly is an epicardial vessel segment that divides into multiple interwining segments with eventual convergence at the distal vessel. Um, it's rare anomaly with incidence less than 1%. Uh, PCI could be challenging in such patients. And when LED is out of the equation, PCI is easily justified over uh, cabbage. So regarding the planning for such case, um, my plan was to start with an anti-grade wire escalation, and plan B is to selectively engage the corner branch and uh, do retrogradely via this uh, septal collateral. However, the point is we don't know how this connection at the LED uh, behaves in the woven anomaly course. Um, I started with two amplets guiding to um, switch the amplets from the left system to the corner branch if uh, shifted retrogradely. This is a dual injection. I started with the um, Gaia second um, uh, wire with support of Corsair Pro microcatheter. Um, the advancement of the Gaia was not, I, I was not fully um, comfortable with the course. However, it remained within the vessel uh, architecture, um, getting angiograms in different orthogonal views. It remains within the vessel architecture on the right side uh, angiogram. and finally reaching the distal RCA to the large PL, and it was then replaced with a workhorse wire. <coughs> After ballooning um, established flow across the RCA, I put in an IVUS um, catheter, and it shows this um, um, a lovely formation of the woven um, anomaly with multiple small lumens. Uh, one appeared here at 12 o'clock, another one at three, and another one will appear at 11 o'clock. Then this is uh, a larger uh, convergence than uh, the um, RCA proximally. Uh, this is a, a, a nice publication in the European Heart Journal uh, back in 2013 with the first report examining the histopathology of the woven anomaly. This is a one a centimeter excision of patient uh, underwent cabbage um, showing um, nicely the um, multiple humans uh, at the uh, woven anomaly segment with a single outermost uh, coat compo composed of um, um, internal elastic lamina. Um, I deployed um, 3.5 by 48 stent proximally, uh, after which I had um, no reflow at the distal RCA. I put another stent. Um, still has some um, impaired flow distally. I put an IVUS again, it showed some disease, so I um, give intracoronary uh, drugs um, and uh, further dilatation and ended up by a DCP to the distal RCA segment, um, three by 40 millimeter distally, um, having this final result. So my take home message is that woven coronary disease is rare pathology with unknown etiology. Although initially considered benign, recent um, case reports publication report significant myocardial ischemia caused by uh, the affected vessel. PCI is doable in woven anomaly. Intervascular imaging is helpful in terms of landing zone selection and vessel sizing in this scenario. Thank you.
That's great. I mean, I've, I've never seen coronaries like this, I have to admit. My, my question to you is, at the end of the intervention, it seems there were much, much less collaterals to the LED. I know the LED territory probably is dead from what you presented, but let's assume it was not. I mean, th that would have been probably detrimental for the patient, right? Because you, by stenting that whole area, you cut off so many of the collaterals that were going to the, even to the circumflex. Yes, the, the retrograde filling of the LED was mainly from the conus branch. So if the guiding was intubated in the RCA, you didn't give, you didn't appreciate this much filling. So the, the filling through the conal branch was still there even after PCI. But yes, if the LED territory was viable, this would have changed the equation, um, I know. Um, however, uh, however, I think the surgeons will not be um, encouraged to graft this distal LED. Yeah, so the conus branch fre uh, can frequently give uh, ipsilateral right to right collaterals or to the left. And sometimes what happens is you see some outside films and you think you're going to set up for your CTO and you put your dual uh, guides in. And one of the guides intubates the right corner a little deep, cuts off the conus, and you don't see flow through it. And, and you're like, what happened to the collateral? I can't see the distal vessel. And you just got to pull back. So in this case, I think that's absolutely right. I think it was the conus that was providing a lot of the collateralization to the LAD. Additionally, this is like a great example of the diagnostic pictures look very concerning, but when you actually have your dual injections, it lays it out quite nicely for integrated yeah. um, wiring. And you know, um, angiographically, I, I think uh, woven coronary artery disease and a recanalized or partially recanalized CTO is sometimes hard to differentiate. Um, obviously, you proved it with intracoronary imaging. Um, I have personally only once before done PCI in, in woven um, anomaly where we wired, we OCT'd, found out that it was, you know, it had that classic honeycombing appearance, and then we decided to go ahead, balloon and stent. But yeah, nicely, nicely done. Congratulations. Thank you. Any plans on fixing the um, um, We are following the patient. Um, his symptom is much controlled. Um, the distal CX, I don't, we don't have any previous uh, angiograms, for, so we don't know as, uh, how much is the length of this occluded segment. So I think this will planned if he's symptomatic, we can tackle it. I guess uh, the question I have is, um, is there any viability testing of the LAD? And um, you know, if it showed viability, not necessarily at the apex based on your echo, it sounds like that is gone. But if the anterior wall, for example, is viable, would you consider going after the LAD? Yes, uh, if it is viable. Uh, in all honesty, the echo um, um, uh, image was not questionable regarding the viability. It's clearly thinned out LED territory. But if we have a borderline image, if it is a preserved thickness as well, we would uh, use another modality to assessing the viability uh, and then do a hard team meeting to uh, decide the planning, uh, reverse colorization plan for the patient. Well, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. case. <laughs> Learned a lot. All right, well done. Well, thank you all presenters. Thank you to Egypt. You guys, all of you came from Egypt, so that's great. And uh, great cases you brought with you. Thank you for supporting the meetings. We really